Hello, my fellow minor league nerds, and look, we're back. Sorry for the two-week break, but the last month at my job has just been completely hectic, uh, which is normal, but it's usually every odd year, not even years. But you're not here for me to talk about my troubles. You're here for the latest episode of the Minor League Nerd. On this special episode, I'm going to recap the Curved Brim Media weekend meetup that took place over Memorial Day weekend. The weekend was announced before we became members of Curved Brim Media. We were, of course, interested in attending, but the cost of flights at the time didn't really agree with our desired price. After being invited to join CBM, we felt we should definitely attend if flights dropped into our price range. Our backup Memorial Day weekend plans was to attend the Memorial Cup in Saginaw, Michigan. Fortunately for us, at the end of February, flights into Charlotte, which is cheaper to fly into from Chicago than Raleigh, dropped into a range that we were looking to pay. So we decided to join the weekend, which included games at the Holly Springs Salamanders, the Durham Bulls, and the Carolina Mudcats. We also decided to add the Kannapolis Cannonballers on Monday as well, later finding out that some people were planning on making Sunday a doubleheader as the Greensboro Grasshoppers were playing a night game. After three months of anticipation, our travel date, Thursday, May 23rd, finally arrived. Of course, like nearly every other flight we've had out of Chicago the last two plus years, our flight was delayed. This one ended up being by three hours. We didn't actually land until after midnight. It wasn't too big a deal as we didn't have any plans for that night. What was a problem, though, is our rental car company closed at midnight. So that meant I had to go back to the airport Friday morning in order to get the rental car. Once that was completed, we were off to Raleigh-Durham. The drive wasn't too eventful, but being a minor league nerd, I did enjoy seeing all the road signs for the towns in which ball teams played, announcing each one in my mind as I drove. In Raleigh, we stopped for lunch at Gringo A Go Go, which was a perfect fit. Not only was the food excellent, and I highly recommend going there, but my wife is a member of a go go dance troupe here in Chicago called the Janes. Inside, they also have an old photo from when the location was actually an Esso gas station. After lunch, we toured the North Carolina Museum of History, which is a fantastic museum and is free. It's a Smithsonian-affiliated museum that explores more than 14,000 years of North Carolina history from its early inhabitants through the 20th century. The museum explores all of North Carolina's history, not bypassing or sugarcoating the darker aspects of its past. We also took a walk around the state capitol. Typically, we like to take a tour or at least explore state capitals on our own whenever we travel. But unfortunately, the North Carolina State Capitol is currently closed due to renovations. After the museum and the State Capitol, we checked into our hotel and headed off to Ting Stadium, home of the Holly Springs Salamanders, for the first game. Ting Stadium is a decent little park that seems like a perfect fit for Holly Springs. The Salamanders were taking on the Martinsville Mustangs in what was our first Coastal Plain League game. The Mustangs took a 1-0 lead in the top of the first, with the Salamanders taking the lead 3-1 in the bottom of the inning. Martinsville added another run in the seventh, extending their lead to 5-3 in the top of the eighth. The Salamanders did tie it up in the bottom of the inning, which led us going into extra innings. The tenth, though, didn't go well for Holly Springs. They gave up five runs before the first out, getting the second and third in successive batters. The CPL begins extra innings with runners on second. The Salamanders were able to advance their runner to third, but were not able to score any more runs, losing the game 10-5. to The game was a lot of fun, with everyone enjoying themselves. But... 
The big event of the game was the tug-of-war that my wife Christina signed us all up for. It was a 4-on-4 four four battle pitting myself, Patrick Larson, Ranger Amy Burnett, and Donnie Wise against Paul Caputo, Christina, Virgil Brooks, and Zach Beeson. Fortunately, Ed caught the entire thing on video, so we hope you enjoy that. As you saw, Donnie, Patrick, Amy, and I came out on top. I have no problem at all admitting that it was all because of Donnie. He was our anchor and did most of the work. After the game, we headed to Ed's house for a post-game hangout, watching various ball games, some hockey, and a little bit of basketball as well. Zach Beeson was not happy that we spent most of the time watching his Angels lose to Ed's Guardians. On Saturday, before heading over to Ed's house for a curved brim lunch, we visited the City of Raleigh Museum, which is located on Fayetteville Street, Raleigh's main street, at the center of downtown. It's located in a former hardware store and is dedicated to preserving and interpreting the history of the capital city while envisioning its future. When we visited, there was an exhibit on the history of baseball in Raleigh taking place. I even voted on a name for Raleigh's possible future MLB team. After the museum, it was off to Ed's for lunch, where we found out that Eric of the Earned Fun Average was also late landing due to flight delays. After the barbecue, we headed over to Durham Bulls Athletic Park to meet up with the others. We drove over with Paul Caputo and Ranger Amy and proceeded to make up rumors about the other members of Curved Brim Media. After parking, we took a walk through the American Tobacco Campus, located across the street from the ballpark, where we met up with the others to have a drink and or something to eat. After Christine and I finished our drinks, we headed over to the ballpark to check it out. This was our first visit to Durham Bulls Athletic Park, and we really wanted to check it out early, as we knew it was going to be a crowded night. We were joined by Virgil Brooks as we walked around the concourse. Of course, one of our first stops was the team's merch shop. I already knew what I wanted to buy and didn't go too overboard, but there were a few things I was kind of interested in, but I just let go. Christina, of course, found the promo crew and signed Paul and Ed up for the Dad Ribbon Dance. But for some reason, the crew never came around to collect them and selected two other dads for the dance. And I think Ed and Paul would have done a much better job. Christina also got us a shout out on the scoreboard. The ballpark really is a nice park with a lot going on. But being a Saturday night game on a holiday weekend, it was of course packed. Seriously packed. 
One thing we did discover on our walk around the park was that they had a Rita's. We first discovered Rita's on our 2015 road trip and have enjoyed it many times whenever traveling along the East Coast. We now have a few here in Chicago, but we don't really live particularly close to any of them, which is probably a good thing while also being a bad thing. I personally am a fan of the gelati, which is layered Italian ice with custard. Cherry Italian ice is my absolute favorite. I went to the stand to get one and was told they can't put Italian ice into the ice cream helmets. So I was conflicted. I really wanted the Durham Bulls ice cream helmet, but I also wanted the Italian ice. So I just went ahead and got the custard in a Bulls helmet. Later in the game, Christina went and they gave her a gelati and an ice cream helmet. Four or five other people from the group went and got the exact same thing. Needless to say, I wasn't happy being the only person in our group to be denied one. I did end up getting one here in Chicago, but that's besides the point. It took me three weeks to get that. I wanted mine that night, but oh well. In the game... Durham fell 4-3 to the Memphis Redbirds. After the game, many people once again went over to Ed's for a post-game hangout. After we had back-to-back late nights, we really needed a good night's sleep and decided to skip it and head back to our hotel. Sunday was doubleheader day with two games in two cities. The Carolina Mudcats were hosting the Myrtle Beach Pelicans in the afternoon, which was an official part of the meetup weekend. This was our first visit to Five County Stadium, which really isn't that bad of a ballpark. It's definitely something that looks very much like it was built in the early 90s. It is a concrete jungle. Thankfully, there were seats in the shade underneath the main bowl because none of us wanted to sit in direct sunlight in the afternoon. Donnie went up to check out the main seating just for a few minutes and said it was extremely uncomfortable, so definitely glad we did the research. Even in the shade, though, there wasn't much wind, so it still got a bit uncomfortable. But they had ice cream and ice cream helmets, which we all enjoyed. Donnie, Patrick, and Eric actually made it their first stop when they got into the ballpark, with me getting one later in the game. Our bad luck for the home team continued as the Mudcats lost 8-7. They made it close towards the end of the game, though, scoring a run in each of the last two frames. After the game, several people stayed behind to play catch on the field, while we headed off to Greensboro to catch the Greensboro Grasshoppers, taking on the Greenville Drive. First National Bank Field really is a beautiful ballpark. But, to Eric Prophet's displeasure, they did not have ice cream helmets. We finally saw the home team win a game when the Grasshoppers defeated the drive 5-4. Since Paul and Amy were unable to attend the game in Greensboro, Christina wore the Caputo hat that she got from Donnie that weekend, so they were there with us in spirit. Fireworks were scheduled for that night they were canceled as it started to rain shortly after the game ended. We stayed that night in Greensboro, intending to drive down to Kannapolis from there on Monday. While still in Greensboro, we visited the International Civil Rights Center and Museum. It's located in the building that housed the Woolworths, where the four North Carolina A&T students started the Greensboro sit-ins at the White's Only Lunch Counter on February 1st, 1960. Photos aren't allowed inside the museum, so the outside shot is all that I have. The lunch counter has been preserved and is still intact inside. It really is a fantastic museum that we highly recommend checking out if you're ever in the area. Up the street from the museum is a statue dedicated to O. Henry, the pen name of William Sidney Porter, who wrote The Gift of the Magi. Afterward, we drove down to Kannapolis, stopping at Village Park once we got into town to check out the carousel, which is something we typically do on our trips. We took one ride together and then waited for Donnie, Rhonda, 
and Patrick Larson to join us so we could all take a ride together. It was really cool to share our love of carousels with others. excited about seeing the Cannonballers, not just because we've heard lots of great things about their ballpark, but also because we're, disgruntled, White Sox fans, and always look forward to checking out the affiliates. The Dash are now the only one left, and we hope to see them next season. We were joined by Donnie, Rhonda, and Patrick at Atrium Health Ballpark, which really is a fantastic stadium. We took our usual walk around the concourse, which is a 360, after visiting the new team shop. I went in expecting to spend a lot of money, and we did. Not quite like we did at the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs two years ago, but not too far off. I mean, they are a White Sox affiliate, and they do have some really incredible gear. When I ordered the tickets for the group, I noticed that they had a free will call option, so of course I selected that. We got these really cool large tickets, which I noticed had club access on them. We were able to walk around the club level to check that out as well. It's a pretty nice area with some memorabilia of the team's history located all throughout. Also at the game, our friend Greasy Keys was playing. We got to see him at the AHL Outdoor Classic in Charlotte in January, as well as at the Checkers game the day before. He was playing his guitar when we first arrived, and we all stopped and got a photo with him. Christina and I then stopped behind home plate to speak with him a little bit during the game. He's a really cool guy, and it's always great to see him. Never one to pass up a promo, Christina signed up for Name That Tune, which took place a half inning after the seventh inning stretch. She was able to sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game with the team's promo crew and Boomer on top of the dugout. All right, ladies and gentlemen, on a baseball trip from Chicago, it's the first contestant for years. tune by getting all three songs correct, she was given this really cool vintage style Cannonballers bobblehead. 
for the last song, Party in the USA, I was really hoping she would have said it was Weird Al's Party at the CIA. I mean, technically, she wouldn't have been wrong. Also at the game, we had a bat dog for the third time that weekend. Our bad luck for the home team continued, except for Donnie and Rhonda, who were quite happy with the outcome as the cannonballers fell 5-4 to four to the Columbia Fireflies. Instead of post-game fireworks, we were treated to the human cannonball Dave the Bullet Smith. It's definitely an interesting line of work and quite the sight to see. excellent weekend in North Carolina. But our trip couldn't end without another flight delay on Tuesday. Thankfully, this one was only about an hour. We had talked about keeping our game day streak going by going to see the White Sox that evening, but the weather didn't cooperate, so we went on Wednesday instead. The Curved Brim meetup really was a great time. It was a lot of fun to meet some of our fellow CBM members and other people in person for the first time, and to spend the entire weekend with people who love minor league baseball just as much as we do. We are definitely looking forward to the next one. Well, my fellow minor league nerds, that'll do it for this special episode. Be sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel or the podcast platform of your choice to be notified whenever a new episode is released. And as always, never stop supporting minor league baseball and never stop learning about minor league baseball history. This podcast is part of the Curved Brim Media Network. Here are some of the other members of Curved Brim Media. Hi, this is Ed Rivera of the Dad Hat Chronicles. Join me as I interview people just like you and players, coaches, GMs on the path that led you to become a fan of the sport. I'm Paul Caputo, and on the Baseball by Design podcast, I talk to minor league baseball teams, designers, and other super interesting people about what these minor league baseball logos mean. And I talk a little bit about ice cream helmets. What's up, Bucketheads? I'm Anna DiTomaso, and each week on the Baseball Bucket List podcast, I speak with a different fan about their favorite baseball memories, what the game means to them, and what's left to check off on their baseball bucket list. Hey, everyone. It's Eric from the great state of Kansas. This is Johnny from the New Orleans Baby Cakes Memorial Museum. And we are the Earn Fun Average Podcast, where we talk to a variety of guests about their love of baseball and have fun doing it. America, lower your standards. Average is what we do best. This is Patrick and Corey of BaseballMapper.com, and we have made an interactive map to help highlight all baseball teams from the majors down to collegiate summer leagues. We want to bring you closer to baseball, so get on the site and find a team near you today. Hey guys, this is Patrick Larson from the Minor League Baseball Hat History Series, and in every episode I go through the history of minor league teams through my personal collection of hats. You can find me on Twitter at at PatLarson1. I hope you guys enjoy. Learn more about Curve Brim Media at curvebrimmedia.com.